Hey guys, thanks for coming to the panel talk with uh, Nathan Hosman from Syndicate DAO and Kaido Cunningham from Utopia Labs. So, I'm Jen, I'm Jen Kang from Global Coin Research. I lead investments, um, so I can give a quick background of what Global Coin Research is, but before we start the panel talk, I actually wanna get a sense of you know, how familiar you are with DAO, but you know, with a raise of hand, like, do you guys know what a DAO is? Raise your hand. Yeah, I, I expect that too. But um, then the next question is, how, like, do you guys know what DAO, t I, I guess, how many people are actually in a part of a DAO? Raise your hand. Okay. Hopefully this like changes your perception about DAO and potentially like join one and actually get to play around with the tools that we're gonna talk about and be a part of a DAO so that you can understand like the, what the conversation is gonna be about. So um, let's start the talk, I guess. So I'll start with Nathan. Uh, we have Nathan Hosman who leads engineering at Syndicate. So if you can give a quick introduction about yourself and what Syndicate does, that'd be great. Hello. I don't think I'm on. Okay, cool. Okay, I'll talk first. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Jin, for the introduction uh, and everyone who came here. I want to echo the uh, the point that hopefully this is uh, this is your sign to join a DAO, right? Uh, and some of the tools we'll talk about here are really helpful for that. Uh, and so, yeah. Come up and ask after if you want to talk about DAOs. Uh, but yeah, so I'm Nathan. Uh, I lead engineering at Syndicate. Uh, we're revolutionizing uh, the way that communities invest together uh, by drastically reducing the costs for communities to form, democratize, raise, allocate capital. Uh, we started in January of 2021 uh, and have since uh, grown and expanded. I think most recent count uh, is 3,500 DAOs uh, launched on top of our tooling. Uh, and so depending on how you define a DAO, that's you know, pro a, a pretty good portion of, of the DAOs that have launched. We've learned a ton of lessons uh, from there uh, and we're continuing to grow and expand uh, our product offerings and, and what we provide to DAOs. Uh, and personally, you know, got into Web3 uh, you know, on an individual level uh, over a year and a half ago, uh, and then in the last year have uh, led our uh, engineering efforts and led our engineering teams. So, uh, and working with great people like Cato, so I guess I'll pass it off to him. Hey, um, my name is Kaido. I'm a co-founder and CEO at Utopia Labs. Uh, really what we do is kind of provide the back office infrastructure to allow DAOs to scale. Uh, all those things like payroll, bookkeeping, accounting, um, all those things that you, know, you don't think matter in DAOs actually kind of do. Um, so we kind of build all the boring tools to help these DAOs scale. So um, yeah, we've been growing as a team as well. Uh, just expanded to 14 um, and support a lot of the DAOs out there. Uh, how many of you are familiar with like DAOs like SushiSwap? Um, cool, yeah, so we support a lot of their invoices, expense workflows, uh, support Lido and a few other larger DAOs out there in regards to a lot of their kind of operations infrastructure. So uh, thank you all for having me on. And um, you know, if you all ever wanna chat after this, uh, feel free to reach me out. I feel like the people here probably didn't, are not part of a DAO, but probably heard of you guys, right? Syndicate and Utopia Labs just closed their massive fundraising round, so Google it if you guys are curious. Um, Utopia Labs just closed a round led by Paradigm. Uh, Syndicate you know, closed a round last year, and also they closed a community round this year led by a 16 z and other folks. Um, I'll give a quick background about myself. I'm Jin, I'm part of Global Coin Research, which is an investment and research DAO. Our objective is to really d democratize investing, right? We provide access for anyone to join our DAO and invest alongside with us in early stage crypto projects. So, I, you know, interestingly, these two projects we've actually invested as a community, so that's why we're part of this panel to, you know, educate you guys about DAO, what, is, what it feels like to be a part of a DAO, running a DAO, and what's the headache, and then what, what these guys are trying to solve. So, thanks for the turnout, it's really great. So, so let me, um, first question, you know, obviously people are curious about, you know, Syndic and Utopia, you guys give a little background, like, how do you guys think about the business model, right? Like, are you just focused on serving the DAOs, or are, do you expect your tools to be used by regular companies late, later down the road? Hello. 
Do I want to start? Okay, cool. Um, so that's a really good question. I think with business models and crypto, it's a, it's a kind of a conflict. Um, I think the way we think about this is, is two types of take rates. There's extractive take rates and then there's expansive take rates. Um, I think we actually just talked about it, but extractive take rates are basically saying, hey, I'm a slash 5% of your payments. Um, expansive take rates are really what's interesting to Utopia. So it's this idea of how do you actually allow these DAOs to earn yield on top of what they're actually already earning and then maybe potentially taking a, a fee from there. Um, so those are sometimes some kind of business models that we're thinking of, uh, this idea of extractive versus expansive. Um, there's native token monetization models that are really interesting to us here at Utopia as well. Um, so those are kind of the things that we think about in terms of business model. Um, so, you know, for us, we've just been really focused on product uh, as a nine-month-old company. Uh, but these are things that we are thinking about as a team quite often. Okay, we're going to have to do a little mic switching. Um, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I think that's a great introduction uh, is the fact that, like, all of these DAOs have different business models because they're inherently doing different things. And so what an individual DAO's business model is might be very different from a platform like ours. And so um, if any of you are familiar with Adam from True Ventures, this is kind of a riff on, 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 his, on his take. But um, you know, one way to look at this, right, especially like for platforms that are more like Syndicate, um, is, is models like WordPress. Um, so WordPress is open source software. Uh, it's a public good. And then communities. Uh, individuals, companies build on top of that um, and value accrues to a higher order than the open source software. So I think uh, approaches that try to short term optimize for commoditizing um, the software at the software layer only um, can, can, can only get so far. And I think the, the, uh, the mission of Syndicate is, is to bring value to a much higher, uh, higher layer. And so when, we, so when Will and Ian, uh, who are the founders of Syndicate, started the company, I think they looked a lot at um, you know, what, what models out there existed. And I think one of the main problems they found were like vampire attacks, where you put this open source software out there, and then if you release it right away, someone to puts a token on it, forks it, puts a token on it, um, and they're not adding any value. And so their thesis was to accrue value to a higher layer, which is the interactions between groups, the inter interactions between DAOs, interactions between people, uh, and that's where we're focusing. Um, so it's, a, it's definitely a long-term play and a long-term vision, and that's why we're ultimately so glad to have so many DAOs on our platform, because we're also learning from them. Yeah, I mean, like, for us, when we invest in Syndicate, like, we were helping them with the beta testing and making sure the users are comfortable with this. You know, it's a very nascent space. We saw the, you know, we saw the crowd, like, everyone knows of DAO, but less than half of the people actually are part of the DAO, right? So there's a pain of, I think, joining a DAO and also being a part of it, being, staying engaged. Like, it's a nascent space, in my opinion, right? So, like, how, like when you guys are working on new feature and Syndicate or Utopia, you're talking to your customers, like, how do you think a profit market fit comes out from that conversation? Like, is it a fluid conversation? Like, do you guys have a view of how do you actually find the right product market fit so that the people will actually use your product instead of, you know, mismanaging their DAO or the tools that they have? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, product market fit in this space is, it honestly is related to the commoditization and the revenue question, right? Because you can't have proper, long-term, sustainable, um, product market fit without, without the, the former or the latter. Uh, so the three principles that I think about when, I'm, when we're thinking about launching a new feature or a new product, uh, is it for it to be scalable, uh, or sorry, specific, uh, extensible, um, uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so I guess specific, like specific and extensible, I'd say, are the two most important. So on the specific side, we strongly believe that features that are features and products that are specific DAO tooling is going to be a long-term higher value than generalized DAO tooling. Um, and the reason that is is you know, if anyone familiar with the birthday problem here, uh, <laughs> like the birthday problem grows n factorial by the number of people that you add to the problem. And so the issue is that when you add generalized DAO tooling that tries to solve everything, what you end up doing is having to onboard everyone in your DAO, everyone onto your team, onto this new software. Um, with all of its built-in assumptions and learnings, and that problem scales and factorial. And so we think that problems that solve specific issues, like Utopia, where you're solving a specific payroll issue or a specific bookkeeping issue, um, are, is going to solve the problems of your community a lot faster and with a lot less pain. And then the extensibility piece of it, when we're, when we're looking for product market fit, is really about, we know that DAOs aren't 
coming to us day one with the same formation, the same structure that they're going to have at day 100. And so we're really trying to build products that are going to allow DAOs to grow, that allows our product to go with the community and allows the community to grow with, with what we're offering. And so, um, you know, 100 days in, a DAO might have several engineers, several contributors that can extend upon the product. And so we're really looking to allow other folks to build on top of us so that ultimately we are the central hub, the central spoke to which that knowledge uh, about how to do best in this space is accruing. Yeah, I think for us, uh, product market fit is interesting as a really early stage company. I think for us, it's just continuous iterations of just shipping fast, um, shipping with the users. I think the way we think about building product is, uh, in most cases, as a traditional software service provider, you're usually extracting value from the user. Um, for us, I think instead of building for a customer, we actually build with a customer. And I'm sure uh, you've actually heard Nathan say building with DAOs. And I think that's kind of the principle that we have at heart as well. Um, so I think we'd like to think that we have this idea of community-run product development. Uh, a really good example is where you know, building with friends with benefits. Um, you know, we're building with a lot of the DAOs that are out there in regards to these custom solutions uh, that need to target their specific verticalized uh, pain points. Um, and I completely agree. I think the principles of, of building wide and, and building specifically and building niche are, are still things that, regardless of if you're building in crypto, if, if you're building a traditional company in Web2, I think those principles are relatively the same in terms of building, uh, ideally, a generational company, right? So um, I think that's the way I think about this. Um, you know, for us, I think the really interesting thing, it's, and I don't really know how to explain it, but DAOs are really interesting because um, they're community run. So um, the way they kind of share their insights, um, the way that they you know, are participating in product feedback is, is pretty incredible. Um, you know, when we tried building businesses, our, our four co-founders up here as well, we all tried building you know, traditional software businesses before. And the thing that's really interesting with DAOs is that there's an in, there's inherent pull uh, of these communities trying to provide this feedback because they want to actually build these things to, to obviously and hopefully uh, solve a lot of their pain points that are just coming across in the day to day. Um, so I think the TLDR is that uh, we're, you know, we're, we don't, haven't hit product market fit yet. I don't think we'll ever will. That's kind of the mindset that I think we try to be in. Uh, it's a consistent iteration and um, that's kind of the way we think about building product at a high level though. Keeps you guys dri driven and hungry, so that's always a good thing. Um, yeah, I think you guys brought up a good issue, right? It's almost a chicken and egg problem, right? Like you, got, you need a lot of DAOs to serve, but at the same time, DAOs are successful and sustainable if they're right tools to use to manage the organizations, right? Like at GCR, the main issue we have is obviously how do we manage a large membership, right? We have like 4,500 plus members. How do you manage them, right? Discord's not the perfect solution. Like how do you manage like, you know, payments, invoicing? How do you, you know, scale easily? Meaning how do we spin up right number of investment vehicles to invest in these early stage crypto projects? And I think Nathan and Kaido brought up a good point. It's almost like you have to build with them, right? So like, and like, to that point, I'm actually curious, like, do you guys have dedicated people within the team that will work with a couple top DAOs or bigger DAOs and have like a, I don't know, recurring call to make sure what, what are the issues that they're facing that you want to solve and how do you do that? I guess it's like, uh, do you guys do recurring regular customer calls, I guess? Yeah, I can take that one. I mean, that's actually, I think, how we first met and Joyce and I also met. Uh, what are these recurring calls? I mean, ideally, I think at an early stage, every single person, including all the engineers, are on those recurring calls, and you're going to derive so much value from them. Um, so we're continuing to do that, especially when we launch new products, um, because, yeah, I mean, essentially you learn with, with the groups that you're working with exactly what their needs are. So uh, we've you know, had calls with groups like Seed Club who just wanted to chat, who just wanted to know what was the new hotness, here's the crazy idea we had, what if we organized in this way, what if we structured our, our entities in this way? Um, and, and those are the, honestly the most fun calls when you get to the point of like fig jam, you're like in a fig jam and you're dragging around all different like legal entities and structures, you're dragging around ways that you can con combine those. Uh, and I, I, think that's, I think that's really where I, I hope that's what all DAOs are trying to get to, all, like, especially with DAOs working with each other. Yeah, I think for us, uh, I guess the, the, the principle of doing things that don't scale are probably pretty apparent. But uh, what we've done uh, is, you know, uh, for, you know, any demos, uh, instead of kind of going to a Google Meets or a Zoom chat, we actually have that hyperlinked right in our Discord. Um, you know, we demo uh, and we individually onboard every one of our customers. Um, and then with a lot of the larger customers, we have custom Discord group chats. Um, and, you know, giving a few shouts, there's TracerDAO, BadgerDAO, th both those customers are, are, are really hands-on with the people that we work with as well. So uh, that recurring frequency and that iterative 
iterative feedback loop is, is absolutely required. So um, that's pretty much our customer development process. Um, we try to keep it really tight, um, you know, and we try to filter that product feedback. And I think the hardest thing for us is knowing that sometimes, and in, in, you know, in these small cases, customers aren't always right, right? So it's up to, it's up to us to validate the problem, um, and then it's up to us as, as well to build the solution that fits that problem and that use case. And that's been a, a really fun challenge as well for us. Um, but those are kind of the processes that we have in place. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty collaborative process, right? Like, you know, we are working with a lot of these tools out there so that, like, we can help them solve the right issues at, at core, which is kind of different from the traditional, I would say, Web2 world that you see, right? Customers are not engaged, but here, because, so, because it is such a nascent space, both the DAOs and DAO tools need to, you know, need to do well for each other to, like, you know, benefit from the ecosystem that we're part of, right? So um, next question I'm sure a lot of people are asking is, you know, you guys are the leaders in the space that you play in. Or as a category DAO tool, they're the household names. Everyone, I mean, if you read, you know, tech news, like you've heard of the fundraising rounds. What do you think makes a DAO tool successful? Because, you know, we were seeing a lot of tools being, you know, created as we speak. A lot of, you know, young developers, smart founders are building these tools. Like, how do you think about what makes a tool strong and good to use? Yeah, that's, that's a really important question. I mean, ultimately, all DAO tools are solving coordination problems. So at the heart, these are human coordination problems, how to get people who are across the world with completely different ideas to work towards a common mission. At a company, that might be a little bit easier because there's alignment around things like salary. There's alignment around, um, you know, there's like, there's, you know, people want a job. But that's very different in the DAO. Uh, can be very different in the DAO. And so, that's what DAO tools are often solving. So I think from first principles, when designing a DAO tool, you have to be solving a problem of coordination. Um, so I'd say that's, that's, that's sort of first principles. And then on top of that, I think that most people here have all the, important, all the most important DAO tools in their pocket already downloaded. Twitter, uh, Discord, uh, and Telegram. So ultimately, you know, the, the question is like the age old question of should we, you know, it's like, should we add another discord channel? I think all, you know, you can extend to DAO tools, which is like, should we add another DAO tool? And, you know, for folks who are building new DAO tools, I think kind of reflecting back on my last answer was that it also, you know, needs to be specific. It needs to be extensible and composable. So, um, you know, solving a coordination problem and then a, ideally a, a really specific one that affects and makes the lives better of individual DAO contributors uh, is, I think, is the sweet spot. Yeah, not, not too much to add here. I think, uh, obviously, biased, but I think the interesting thing, speaking from, you know, our strict building experience, uh, traditionally with companies, uh, there were really antiquated processes, right? Bookkeeping, uh, payroll, budgeting, all of these things were siloed to specific decision makers where, you know, a few people decided for the behalf of a company. The thing that we've noticed with our product is that a lot of these things are actually crowdsourced. Uh, these are things that um, a community depend on, right? It's not just specific people making these decisions that interact with our software. So I think the thing that we've noticed is, um, you know, specifically in our experience, is instead of building this verticalized payment execution tool, we try to think of ourselves as almost a workspace, right? We try to think of it as a way um, that the most important thing is actually coming to this consensus layer of saying who should we pay and what should we pay them, and then executing the payment is just a byproduct. Um, so that's kind of the way we think about this, and it actually directly ties into Nathan's point here in regards to this idea of consensus, core nation, um, probably a buzzword, but it's, it's truly kind of the things that humans haven't been able to solve since, you know, uh, we, we were alive, right? So I think it's software is a really interesting approach, and obviously crypto in of itself is a really interesting approach to that. Hence the conference is called Consensus, right? Like it's not a buzzword, but um, like I think they br bring up a good point because part of the objective we have is we want the members to participate and earn for their work, right? I think that's where the coordination problem actually we see like firsthand, right? Like we have a lot of members, a lot of contributors stepping up to invest and also bring deals over to the community so that we can invest alongside with each other. And that's like a issue that will be there. I think, um, you know, it will, might not be solved in the near term, but it's a problem that could be solved with the right tools that, you know, these smart folks are building. And hopefully, you know, most of the people like, I'm seeing could like join a DAO and find, find like joining a DAO and being a part of a DAO would not be an issue. It's not really a challenge. It's actually going to be an easy, it's like a second job, right? Or even third job. It's, or it could even be your hobby. Like that's the pitch that we are trying to have, you know. Think of DAO as like, you know, hobby, right? Like you join it. If you like it, 
you don't think that's a job, right? You still also get to like earn money for your for the work that you contribute to the DAO. Like that's amazing, right? So um, then let's think about the go to market strategy, right? So you know, as we know, there are a lot of DAOs that are being created as we speak, but also a lot of DAOs also you know go away and exist. Right? How do you guys think about go to market strategy? Like, do you guys pick like the top? like large DAOs and work with them or do you guys personally like to work with a newer DAOs so that you can basically beta test your business model with the new DAOs? Yeah, actually we were talking about this before and I think we have different approaches and I think all different approaches work, right? For us, specifically Utopia, uh, we realize that like payroll is kind of something that actually affects a lot of these larger DAOs, right? There's not, you know, if you and me start a side project, um, we wouldn't need to go on Gusto right away, right? So um, it's you and me hacking away um, and, and just building stuff. Um, but as soon as it becomes something more tangible in that sense, uh, we realize that that's when, you know, our product specifically comes in and becomes really valuable. Um, so I think customer segmentation, I think it's very hard to just say, hey, we're going to target DAOs. Um, you know, the way we think about this is, you know, there's a certain amount of contributors that are relatively valuable to us making our product a valuable in of itself. Um, so I think there's really just small customer segmentation things that you could do from that end. Um, you know, and then there's categories, right? There's verticals, like Syndicate is um, doing some really cool stuff with investing DAOs. Um, you know, we, we serve a lot of different types of DAOs as well, uh, whether it's NFT collecting DAOs to DeFi protocol DAOs to um, other different types of DAOs. And I think uh, that type of segmentation is also really valuable. So I think, and you know, I, hopefully it is, but uh, I think the DAO market is, is too big to generalize. It's too ambiguous now. Um, and it's not even that big, so I think we're all early in that sense as well. But uh, I think that segmentation is really important, and that's kind of the way we thought of our go-to market strategy. At a high level as well, these things like bookkeeping, accounting, all these types of things are really valuable, again, for when you actually do become uh, much more of a mature organization, so to say. Um, I don't think there's an enterprise DAO category, but um, you know, that's kind of the way we think about our product and, and, and the people we provide value to and the DAOs that we provide value to. Yeah, I, for us, I, that's a great point. We, I think, yeah, we're coming at it from a slightly different angle, which everything works, is that, I mean, we're really trying to live up to the idea of, of democratizing investing. And so what that means is working with groups who are pushing the bounds of what exactly, who can be an investor, who can invest, who can create deal flow. So the, what you were just talking about is a fantastic example, is like a, like a carry model, a scout carry model, uh, in which in, uh, we've talked to a couple groups like, who are interested in that, who are saying, well, wait a minute here, people bring value to deals, not just based on the amount of money that they can invest, but the time that they can put into the deals, the connections they have, the asymmetric knowledge that they have about the space, right? And so working with groups like y'all who have a completely different idea about who can add to a, the, like a value of a deal allows us to design novel primitives ultimately that can serve those groups because the primitives that we come with the the, the tools that we come with from web 2 aren't providing that um, so you know whether you're using yeah if you're using like a more traditional tool there's not an easy way to distribute carry um, based on a vote like coordinate right that allows you coordinate is a tool that allows you uh, to every mem member in the group to mutually consent about what people added to a deal and so um, I think working with groups that are have a different approach is one is one take and then I think another piece of that is working with groups who are working to bring demo like investing to markets that are outside of Sand Hill Road, right? Like are outside of like just really niche pockets of where investing happen. Um, and honestly, that's my favorite part of like our Discord is when people chime in with uh, a crazy idea. So I was just talking with someone recently who wanted to start a DAO to sell rubies um, for collateralization uh, it, to build like remote uh, technology in India. And so it's like, those are the cool calls. Makes a lot of sense. I, I, I guess, like, then, what's a challenge for you guys? Like, what's the biggest challenge that you face? Is it recruiting? Or I'm sure you guys have a different challenge that you face every day. Like, maybe, maybe share it because it seems like it's so rosy. You know, it's going well. You know, running the DAO seems awesome. We we're at a panel talk, but I think you know it's good to hear like what's the challenge that you guys are facing every day. Oh yeah, I guess I'm gonna go first. If 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 you've come away from my talks making making it sound like it sound rosy, uh, then I failed. It is absolutely not. Uh, coordination problems are ultimately the hardest to solve um, of all human problems. So <laughs> to start, it is absolutely not rosy. Uh, on a technical side, uh, from an engineering perspective, um, building primitives that 
are ultimately on smart contracts that you ship and then must live uh, live forever <laughs> uh, is 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 always going to be a technical challenge, especially when, like I mentioned, we want to build tools that are extensible so that others can build on top of them uh, and are specific, um, uh, but not overly specific that they, for example, you can't just encode the current SEC regulations into, into a smart contract. Like, you have to think more broadly than that. And so, uh, from an engineering perspective, I would say uh, building those tools that last forever. Um, and then from a, a broader perspective, it's being flexible enough to grow with the community and not having hubris to think that you have all the answers. Um, because, I mean, it's a little bit of a trope, but we're so early <laughs> uh, that if, we, if you think that you have all the answers, um, then you're going to ostracize portions of your community that don't, that don't have those answers yet uh, and might feel like they want to contribute something new, but that they don't see themselves in the vision of your product. Yeah, I think there's traditional like startup you know challenges. Uh, one thing is like how do you think about product uh, verticalization versus horizontalization of like a software stack? Like those are things that I think are worth thinking about. And um, you know I think maybe from like a, a, a kind of like a crypto angle, I think one thing we try to think about here at Utopia a lot is um, you know we're we're really serving value to an existing market, but how do we actually grow this market as a whole? I think that's probably the most important and interesting question. And I think um, those are the types of th questions that we try to ask ourselves here um, because right now we're we're almost a software provider, right? I think. Um, that's been a great go-to market strategy for us, but I think as a team and as a, as a, as a company, uh, we have much larger ambitions in regards to the way we think about our product and, and the way we think about growing this market as a whole. So I think, I think that's the way we think about this in regards to some of the biggest challenges, and I think those questions are always unanswered, right? Um, you know, there might be a golden moment at a certain point in time, but I think those are some of the things that we love to think about. Um, you know, I don't have an answer yet. I wish if someone doesn't have an, have an answer, someone come to me, but, um, you know, I, I don't have an answer myself. I mean, if you guys do have answers, like, you guys should join them, you know, join their team. We're hiring, by the problem. way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're hiring. <laughs> we are hiring, but we're DAOs. So you can join and participate. But um, I think you guys do bring up a good point. It's like a, almost a social experiment, right? Like we're funding this social experiment to see if we can actually solve this coordination problem, even if it's not 100% solved. Can we like solve 50% of that to make it a little bit more seamless experience for everyone part of a DAO, trying to create a DAO, manage a group. Like it, it, it's, a, it's a fun activity at the end of the day, but you know, they're obviously out there to make that a seamless experience for everyone. So hopefully um, you guys enjoyed the talk, but we have a few minutes left. I know you guys are skipping brunch um, to attend this talk. So if you guys have any questions, like there's a mic in the middle, so you guys should you know, stand and ask any questions for Kaido, Nathan, and myself, uh, if you have any questions about DAO, DAO tools, et cetera. Hello? Yeah. Hi. Um, earlier you mentioned um, basically enterprise, and it didn't sound like there was any real traction there. How do you see it growing? How do you see DAOs growing in, in a large enterprise? Yeah, I think, enter I think, I think the, the clarification, small clarification there is like, uh, I think it's hard to categorize, what does enterprise mean with DAOs? I think there's really large ones, but you know, I don't think at Utopia we've come in with saying, hey, enterprise constitutes a certain amount of treasury volume and the amount of contributors, um, but there are s really large DAOs out there. You know, um, if you look at a few of the ones out there, they have billions uh, in terms of native tokens on their balance sheet. So I'd say that would be considered enterprise, but you know, we don't have like a formal criteria of what that means. Um, but I, I'd say there is the growth of you know, larger DAOs, and we're already seeing that, but um, we just don't have like a specific name to put on it. That's kind of the, the maybe small little kind of thing that we think about there. Okay, and following up on that, um, like with traditional corporate, large corporations, 20, 30,000 people, how do you see DAOs making, you know, uh, headway into that sort of a market? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I think uh, Syndicate has some great, pretty good answers there as well. Um, I'll be super quick, but I think I'd like to think that DAOs are an experiment towards uh, allowing people on the internet to coordinate better. Um, and if that's the case, then people are going to, hopefully DAOs could be the largest type of employment vehicle. Um, that's kind of the way I think about it. That's the aspiration and ambition, but I'll pass it off. Yeah, I would say, I mean, the fundamental question there is about legal structures, I think. Uh, what we've seen examples of is really large organizations creating spin-off organizations, investment clubs for members of their community that are interested in investing together. Um, and those can be, you know, more limited in size, and then they can grow in scope from there. So there's really specific ways, and then there's groups um, like... Uh, larger groups like Time, for example, um, that are doing much bigger experiments and they use different primitives that don't um, necessarily look like securities um, that allow them to, like for example, uh, NFTs, that allow them to coordinate membership and community but in a less rigid way. 
Yeah, I mean, like adding on the limitation is really SEC. Like, I want to like snip this video to like, send it to Gary. Like, take like they gotta like come up with a solution, right? They gotta f give us a framework w with which we can play around with it. And to your point about twenty thousand plus users, like I envision a DAO like where not every twenty thousand users are engaged, right? We like I think that's fine. As long as we have majority of the users being engaged and uh, contributing, like that's what we're trying to solve for. And in order for us to do that, we gotta make a DAO, a platform, an easy one to use and to contribute and participate. And that's what these tools are being used for and that's what the function and the role of a core team is. So hopefully that answers your questions. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Hi. Um, so I'm just going to state an idea and ask the question after. Um, and this is for both of you guys. Uh, the idea is an uh, unchained assessment of financial situation for DAOs and possibly extend that ideally well, uh, good situation to the contributors for potential under collateralized loans. Uh, I think this would be a game changer for attracting talent as DAO could just uh, extend their financial well-being to their contributor for the potential uh, solution for under collateralized loans. Uh, is this idea in your vision outside the scope of your organizations or already on the roadmap? I'll take it. Um, that's fascinating. Uh, come and talk. To, I would say let's talk after. Uh, I want to think a little bit more about that. but. I do know of what we do. I have talked with organizations that are working to reward contributors in a really fascinating way to give them equity. Um, so we're working with a group that is um, a, a, a group of startup founders that is, it, it started by a traditional fund, but then each founder is actually getting equity in the other people's, the other founders' companies um, in order to hedge risk, lots of other benefits. So I think there's some potential overlap there. Thanks. Thank you for the very informative panel. I want to follow up on the question of engagement. So you kind of characterized DAO, one of the key problems is coordination. I was wondering, for the different DAOs you worked with, what's the uh, percentage of user actually contribute? We talked about this much. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, again, like this isn't like, this is rough napkin math, but imagine 10,000 people in a Discord. Uh, 1,000 people are going to be talking in the Discord. Um, 100 people might be doing bounties, part-time work, contributing to the protocol, and then 10 people are core contributors that are driving meaningful change, maybe on a day-to-day -day basis or some sort of more full-time kind of vehicle. Um, you know, those are rough napkin math. I'm actually, I'd rather ask Jin here in regards to what he's seen from his uh, engagement metrics, but that's kind of a, a framework um, that, uh, you know, a DeFi founder, a, a DeFi DAO founder spoke to me about, and he said that's like a probably a good way to uh, size the, the way you think about engagement, but again, um, I'm sure DAOs have done a, a really good job of in terms of maybe upping that engagement level, but that's kind of like a rough framework that I usually put in my head. Yeah, I mean, like, to, to give concrete numbers behind the math that Kaido just walked through, we have about over 4,500 members. Out of that, a little bit over 200 members are the ones who are actually actively investing. So I would say that's over 5%. Um, that's like a really good engagement rate, in my, in my opinion, because in a way, like, you want to invest, like there's a threshold that you got to, there's a minimum threshold. You got to be a credit investor in the US. So even if with that restriction, the fact that we have a, at least 5% plus engagement rate from the members is quite awesome. And you know, we're trying to push that to 10%, 15%, 20%. Again, um, I think the limitation is really the platform that we're, we're using. Discord is just not the best platform for us to engage the members, but obviously there are other ways for us to capture engagement. Even if the members are not investing or directly investing, as long as they're participating, participating in events, joining the calls, in other ways, supporting the portfolio companies that we invest in, like that's another way that we can look, take a look at the engagement metric. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I'm a little surprised that 5% uh, is satisfactory. But I'm, you know, you guys work on investment DAOs, but there are other type of DAOs where it's not about you know, monetary gain. For those uh, type of DAOs, is uh, user motivation a key problem? And what are, what are the DAO tooling uh, helping this space? I guess like, I, I want to answer your first point. 5%, I think, seems small, but at the same time, we've been around for less than a year around, right? A lot of DAOs are just out there, and crypto in itself is a pretty small space, I would say, uh, relative to the you know, larger market. For other DAOs, I think that's the biggest challenge for them. Like, what's the value proposition of your DAO? Like, why do you have to spend two hours a week following through the server? Like, why do you have to like, engage with them? That's a, that's a fundamental problem. I think. My thesis is that DAOs that will survive have actual clear value proposition. For us, 
unlike other investment DAOs where you have to commit a certain amount of money to join, we actually let the members to choose how much you want to invest in every opportunity that comes through you. So theoretically, you don't have to invest any dollar, but still be part of the DAO, but learn about the projects that are coming into the DAO and understand, wow, these are the projects that are being fundraised. Like, I want to potentially start a new project. So it's almost a good educational resource. And I think for that reason, we have a pretty strong market, product market fit because we attract both the invest, I guess, people who want to invest early stage crypto projects. We also attract the right number of developers and founders who want to start something in the crypto space. Because at the end of the day, for this space and for DAOs to grow, we need to help them with resources through which they can either start something or participate in other protocols or DAOs for this ecosystem to, su to succeed. Like, that's my view. All right, thank you. I don't want to take too much. Okay, okay so question perhaps uh, specifically for Nathan. So you said that uh, so far you guys have around something like 3,500 uh, DAOs launched on your platform, right? So. Any comment on, let's say, some of the most uh, common problems or pain points uh, from your customers that they raise and you have to solve for them, like you know, from your customer support, things of that nature? I mean, any of the most, uh, uh, you know, like most pains that they have, maybe especially for the customers who whose uh, members, uh, the majority of them are not in the US, for example, right? And maybe uh, also many people are not accredited investors. So, I mean, yeah. any comment on that? Yeah, happy to comment. That, <laughs> you actually hit the nail on the head. That is the most common question we get. So, if you join our Discord on any given day, the question is, I am not in the US. My entity is, you know, hosted elsewhere domiciled elsewhere, um, and what are the restrictions that apply to me? So I think across the world, pe what the question people are asking is, uh, how do I launch my DAO? How do I launch my community in a sustainable way um, that doesn't put us, doesn't put me, doesn't put our community members at any sort of legal risk? And we don't have the answer to that for every country. Reasonably, most countries don't have legal regulations on the books even like the US, they give any guidance. Um, so we have a channel called uh, Need a Lawyer, uh, in which there is fascinating discussions in which you can learn about crypto laws in I, I, probably over 50 countries at this point. Um, and I, that, is, that is the most common challenge. And so uh, I think, uh, I think that's, gonna, that's kind of what I was saying about solving with the community, is that we're, we know that we don't have the answer for creating X type of DAO in, you know, uh, in, in Kenya, for example. And so, uh, but we want to learn with the community. You could, you could probably be a lawyer. I could be? Yeah, 50, 50 countries, that's pretty impressive. But next question, sorry. Thanks, guys. Uh, great talk. Uh, you mentioned about DAO tooling solving coordination problems. Um, from your experience, what are the easiest coordination problems out there and what are the hardest to solve? Again, uh, you'll recognize my bias here, but I think uh, one thing that's interesting about us is um, I think there's two types of coordination in, in, at a high level, right? The coordination, like there's micro decisions of who does what task, but I think the way we think about this is DAOs are powerful because they manage two things, right? Uh, they manage liquid labor uh, and they manage liquid capital. Um, these are the two things that are extremely interesting with DAOs where anybody can jump into a DAO, jump out. Um, you know, in some senses, capital is something where once a decision is made, uh, everything can be done through a smart contract, right? So I think the way we think about this is the coordination of these two most important things uh, of a DAO um, are the things that are really hard to solve. Uh, in fact, you know, I don't have a number here, but when you look at a snapshot, you know, proposal, um, it's, hey, where should we allocate this part of the treasury? Um, and um, in fact, that's probably how uh, most of the coordination challenges that GCR might face, and I'd love to hear what you think, is should we invest in this company? Um, again, that's the allocation of, of treasury and capital, right? So I think, I think that's the way I, I try to put the frameworks in, and I'm sure there's much other coordination challenges. I think, you know, um, there's coordination of who does what task, right? But I think the way we think about this is trying to kind of come in with another higher level where it's just like, uh, it's not what task, it's what project, how should we allocate our budget? Like all of these things are the things that matter um, at the end of the day. So I think those are the two hardest and most important coordination challenges. 
Hey guys, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious about how you guys think about the international groups that come to the DAOs. Um, you're missing out a lot of uh, talent and you know a lot of great ideas when you are you know just speaking English. Um, you know a lot of Chinese people, Russian, or whatever it is. Um, how do you guys think about that? And how are you guys um, are you guys thinking about a product to to build out that uh, structure to collaborate? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. So. Um, at one point, half the engineering or half the team at Syndicate was international, was non-U.S. based. So it's definitely even just when we wanted to set up our own internal group, we had, we spent so much time trying to figure out what were the laws that would would, would work for that. So it's certainly a challenge for everyone. Um, I think a couple a couple fold. First of all, uh, we are we are actively. I mean, we we promote, but also want group like folks to join our discord that have long-term engagement and have long-term excitement about that and we're working with a couple individuals already um, for Mandarin and a couple other languages to help them onboard them into like a, a, a role to help route questions right and so um, with I'd say the first answer is with the community um, kind of like what I said last and then the second answer is honestly what I said before is around extensibility so our, our front end is just one front end that ultimately will be built on top of our protocols. Uh, I hope that you know we're sitting here 10 years from now and the amount of front end code that has been written uh, by Syndicate is one one thousandth or one one hundred thousandth of all of the, the front end code ever written that works on our protocol. Um, so we already have groups that are doing that, that are taking it. Um, and I, you know, I wanna see groups that are creating you know, carve outs for, let's say, Singapore, um, Singapore uh, investment laws that, um, you know, are completely different use cases to what we're expecting. Um, and we wanna provide the, the rails, the, like uh, the infrastructure to do that. Um, and to know that, that that infrastructure is safe, is audited, is, you know, formally verified, it can grow over time. Um, but ultimately to, to pass the baton off to folks who know better. Yeah, quick word is I think DAOs are meant to be global and permissionless from day one. We've seen, you know, we've supported DAOs like YGG based in Southeast Asia to DAOs in Europe to DAOs in um, South America. So I think the one thing we've seen is to an extent DAOs are already global, right? They're, they're already organizations where uh, I know core contributors uh, for maybe one specific project that's based in North America, but, you know, somewhere else. And I think that's the beautiful thing about DAOs in that sense. Um, software is a global language, right? Um, you know, so those are some of the interesting things that we see. But I think, you know, the specific translation components, I think Nathan touched on in regards to just like, you know, specific jurisdictions, et cetera. Thanks, guys. Other tools for coordinating the discussion and coordination of your community members outside of Discord. I think I heard you guys mention uh, team calls of some kind. So I guess that's like Zoom or things like that. What else would you use besides Discord for those of us who were not Discord fans? Too. I, th uh, I think there's different types of like conversation, right? I'd love to have Jin touch base here. Snapshot, uh, forum-like proposals. I'm a big fan of this idea of like async long threads that allow people to kind of unpack these things, right? Um, you know, there's coordinate as well as a way of like c coordinating there, but specifically messaging formats. I think the forum-like softwares are, are pr potentially pretty valuable, but we'll pass it off. Yeah, so I think for us, we recognize a lot of the members are not going to log into Discord every day to check what deals we're looking at, what investments we're taking a look at. So we actually have used email as another way, right? We, we send members emails, hey, these are the list of investments we're doing. If you're interested, we're sending you, sending you a link to the specific channel about that deal. So you can click on it if you're interested. Another way, I think, is also messaging, right? Like you, have, you share your numbers or et cetera, and then we can have a group chat about this. To Kaido's point, though, like I think ultimately we are thinking of building our own application, like a, our own website, so that people don't have to rely on Discord, but you can just go onto a website like globalcoinresearch.com, and then you can basically see what's going on, participate in that rather than going to Discord. But ultimately, I, I view, I, I see a lot of um, startups, tools that are being built so that you can migrate away from Discord because ultimately, it's just gonna be another communication platform that's out there for Web3 community. I don't know if that's the right approach, but that, that's at least the first step. So perhaps we could think about this as like uh, channels and you have this messaging that goes out to those who want to consume on Discord and then email and then digest whatever it is. Is that right? Coordinate and so forth. Yep. All right, thanks.
Thank you for the talk. And this could be a very basic question, but um, I'm from Tokyo and I'm creating a DAO in Tokyo. And the question that I always get is, does it have to be DAO? You know, like you can create a company and you can do it in like Web2 traditional style. And how do you guys like respond to that kind of question? <laughs> I can, yeah, I can take this. I mean, there, I, I think it's more of a thesis around the way that you want to build mm -hmm. your your idea, right? So ultimately, there's a seed idea, and that idea could be done in a number of ways. It could be done as a nonprofit, it could be done as a company, it could be done as a DAO. And I think the question that DAOs aim to answer is how do we do this um, in which uh, there's ownership, um, uh, there is specifically ownership by the folks that have built it and put time and equity and, and labor into it, um, how do we build it in a trustless way, um, and uh, how do we build it, as you said, generationally, uh, so that it's not, uh, let's say, driven by any specific, one specific market cycle, but rather um, is owned by the community that built it. And so if the intention is to build an idea out so that it can be owned by the community that built it, I don't think there's a better solution than DAOs. Um, and so uh, I'm a big proponent of them. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it, the collectivization of, of ideas is immensely powerful. We're gonna be able to do much more together than we are alone. Sorry, I actually just came from Japan. Uh, so that's really cool. I just came from Tokyo as well. Uh, my mom lives there. Um, anyways, I, I think uh, the, the one kind of quick example that I usually give is like, uh, let's just point to DeFi DAOs and protocols there, right? I think transparent financial products that are being built on the blockchain require transparent governance processes that determine how things are being built, right? So I think that's the way I try to frame why DAOs are so powerful. Um, you know, I think from a finance angle, there, there's a clear kind of use case there. Um, and we're starting to discover use cases as we go. Investing is something that's usually kind of ambiguous, um, lack of standardization probably, right? And mm -hmm. those are the things that I think require those types of processes. Um, but again, always open to, to being challenged and feel free to prove me wrong, but those are the, that's the way I try to think about it. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. Well, thanks guys for the time. Thanks Kaido, thanks Nathan. Um, I guess we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll be staying around uh, for the next 10, 15 minutes. So if you guys have any questions, come up to us. If you're interested in investing with us, come to me, Syndicate, and uh, Utopia Labs. Thanks guys. Thank